Well, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Happy Sabbath. Beautiful day that God's provided for us today. For my message this afternoon, I'd like you to go ahead and turn over to 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to go through a little section here <clears throat> about the story of Elijah. Brethren, have you ever been really discouraged or depressed? I'm sure many of you have, even as a Christian. It's possible to be that way. Have you ever sunk to the depths of despair where you see no way out? If so, you'll identify with this story of Elijah that we're going to read here. We're going to kind of go through some of this here in 1 Kings chapter 18. Kind of lead you into this story. We have Elijah, God's great prophet, who is going to, we're going to see, feel, feel uh, downright sorry for himself. And ironically, we're going to learn that this depression came after the greatest victory of his life and ministry. So let's begin the story here in 1 Kings chapter 18 and, um, and verse 17. It says, And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, well, I've not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, or Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Elijah basically says, you know, I'll tell you what, Ahab, let's have a showdown. Let's have a rumble in the jumble, jungle. Let's bring all of your people over here and let's put them all together, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and let's see who really is the power here. And so Ahab called all the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth together, and Elijah told them, you know, you go ahead and go first. You've got the sun god, this supposedly powerful god. You can go first. And so the prophets of Baal began to call upon their god. And we see in verse 26 of 1 Kings 18, and they took the bull that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, and saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is missing or he's relieving himself, which means he's going to the bathroom. <laughs> or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened, as he mocked them. And they cried aloud and cut themselves as their custom was with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, and no one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah says, you know, now I'm going to build an altar, and we're going to drench it completely with water, bring a bowl, let's put it on there. And so the altar was completely soaked with water. And Elijah began to pray, and we see this in verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, or Kishon and slaughtered them there. 850 of them. So now Elijah is ready for phase two. And we know the storm is coming. There had been a drought for three and a half years. The rain is returning and... Elijah tells Ahab, you better go eat while you can. And so he does. And so then Elijah comes up to Mount Carmel and begins to pray, asking God to send the rain. And then we know that Elijah's servant went out seven times looking for that rain. And he sit, comes back and he says, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand, very tiny. And that's all Elijah needed to hear. And he told Ahab, you better beat a quick path back to the palace because the rain is coming. And so Ahab finally gets to the palace, he comes home, and he sees his lovely wife at home, Queen Jezebel. <laughs> now you have to understand a little bit something about this relationship. Ahab was henpecked, I believe, by Jezebel. 
Jezebel was, in a sense, Israel's Rasputin. She was the power behind the throne. And so Ahab comes in, he says, hi, honey, I'm, I'm home. I have some good news for you, and I've, I've got some bad news for you. The good news is that it's raining. It's going to rain. Yay! Here comes the rain. We haven't had it for so long. The bad news is all the prophets of Baal are dead. Oh, and all those prophetesses of Ashtoreth, you know, that um, prophets of Ashtoreth that eat at your table, they're dead too. And she says, what? And he says, you know, that guy, the guy, that guy Elijah that's mugged on for three years? Well, he's back. And while he brought the rain, he also killed the prophets. And she said, you want to talk about dead? I'm going to give you dead. Elijah is a dead man. That's what she said to him. So word comes to Elijah. And how do you think Elijah would react to this after he had killed 850 prophets, false prophets? Do you think he would have said, eh, I'm not scared of Jezebel, this one person. I just faced off 850 prophets. I called down fire from heaven. I brought back rain that hasn't come for three and a half years. But that's not how he reacted. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> Maybe he knew that. Look at 1 Kings 19 and verse 3 and 4. Here's how he reacted. He says, Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, <clears throat> and left his servant there. So he left his servant there, and he went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came down and sat under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. It was that bad that he was wanting to die. So here we see Elijah sitting under the broom tree and the mighty prophet giving in to discouragement and depression. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's what James tells us. He was just like us. We we're like him. You know what? Elijah wasn't the only man of God who felt depression and discouragement. We know that at times David did, Obadiah did, Jonah, Jeremiah, Job, Samuel. They all had bouts of discouragement or depression. Perhaps you have too. Have you ever been discouraged, depressed? Have you ever been down in the dumps? Well, maybe you be, might be right now. I don't know. Problems at work, problems in the family, problems with health, problems with finances, problems with your spiritual life. It's got you down, and sometimes you say, man, it's just not worth it to go through all of these problems. Now, this is how Elijah felt. He said, you know, to himself, I'm, I'm the only one out here. I'm the only one out here serving God. There's no one else, and it's just me. And now I've got the queen of Israel that's going to kill me. I'm so miserable. God, would you just kill me now? How did he get in this state? I mean, who can explain fear and depression sometimes? Um, sometimes it just hits you. It doesn't make any sense at all where it comes from. Now, there are some fears that people have. Um, you know, there's fear of heights. People have fear of heights. A lot of people have fear of heights. Uh, people have fear of enclosed spaces, claustrophobia. They have fear of open spaces. I don't want to be in a big open area. That's agoraphobia. There's some kooky fears, though. There's a fear called ablutophobia. That's a fear of bathing. I know some people with that fear, actually. <laughs> there is also electorophobia. That is the fear of chickens. You know where you drive down the street and you see a KFC and you just break out into cold sweat? Whew, those chickens are going to come and get me. There's also anuptophobia, the fear of staying single. I probably had that fear at one point. <laughs> I'm sure I did. Um, there's also arachibutophobia. That's the fear of peanut butter getting stuck to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> it's an odd fear, but people really have that fear. Some of these are, are kind of silly fears, but there are real fears that get us down, that do discourage us and get us depressed. But I think in all cases, we fear, brethren, when we don't feel in control. If you don't feel in control, you have fear. We fear the peanut butter getting out of control and we can't open our mouth because it's getting stuck to the roof, right? 
where we're going to choke on it. We fear not being in control of that. We fear that the chicken's going to do something to us that we can't control that situation. We're afraid that we can't control it and it makes us depressed. And Elijah feared that he could not control Jezebel. And he worried himself into this, this pit of despair. And in doing so, he allowed his, his difficulty to be magnified and God was temporarily forgotten. Isn't that what happens to us? We forget or we lack faith in the all-powerful God that we serve, even if it's just temporarily. Elijah was worried about Jezebel's threats to his life after, life after he had just called down fire from heaven. Elijah had a nature just like us. And as a result of his depression, he isolated himself from his faithful servant. He said, stay here. And he went into the wilderness. He wanted to die. So when you're depressed, when you're down, that's not the time to isolate yourself from the people of God. You see, a few statements from a good friend can help us get back on course again. It can help lift us up out of that depressed state. Friends can help us gain the perspective that we've lost. And that's why the Bible says that if one falls that you have a friend there to help lift you up again. But Elijah had isolated himself from his friends and in some ways had really even isolated himself from God. You know, there's another thing to think about here. Low lows often come after high highs. Elijah had, think about this, he had just fought this tremendous battle with 850 prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. And they started early at sunrise. It lasted all day until evening. And he called out to God to bring rain fervently with a strong desire. We also remember he ran at superhuman strength, faster than the chariot of Ahab. He, in some ways, was so busy, was probably running on adrenaline. And after an adrenaline rush, you get a crash and you come down to a low. So we have to realize that God has given us this physical body and that sometimes lows often come after highs. Maybe you haven't had a good night's sleep in a while. Maybe, um, uh, well, I think of the scripture, you know, um, joy comes in the morning. After a good night's sleep, you wake up, you feel refreshed, you feel chipper, you feel perky. You say, oh, this is going to be a better day. You just need some sleep. You just need some rest. Um, Maybe you haven't had a good meal in a while. Sometimes it's just as simple as those things being fixed. Look, here in 1 Kings 19, we see here Elijah in the depths of despair in verse 6. And God sends an angel. And what did he do? He looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked of hot stones and a jar of water. And what did Elijah do? He ate, drank, and he laid down again. Sometimes that's all you need is just a little bit of food and some sleep. And sometimes that doesn't work either. Apparently, Elijah stayed in this depressed state for 40 days. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 11, as God came to him. And God said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Why are you here? How did you get into this state? How did you allow yourself to lose perspective? Have you forgotten that I brought you this far and I'm going to take you to the end? I will not forsake you. I'm going to finish what I began in you. Maybe God could say that to some of us. What are you doing here? Why have you allowed yourself to end up in a state like this, isolated from your Christian brothers and sisters, allowing your problems to be magnified, beyond comprehension and allowing God to be forgotten. Sometimes we get ourselves into places that we shouldn't be, and God could have said it to Samson as he lay his head on the lap of Delilah. Samson, what are you doing here? Why are you here? 
He could have said it to Peter as he warmed himself by the enemy's fire. What are you doing here? He could have said it to the prodigal son in the distant country, rebelling against his father and squandering his inheritance. What are you doing here, son? Maybe he could say it to some of us. Well, we know that Elijah was given a threefold commission by God. He was given something to do, and we know that God comforted Elijah in verse 18 by telling him that he has reserved 7,000 that have not bent the knee. You're not alone. He tells Elijah that, and he tells you that too. You're not alone. You're not alone in this. And so Elijah then emerged from the cave, and he started to serve the Lord. He did something. So brethren, if you're feeling down, relinquish control to God. You can't control every situation. Relinquish control to God. He is still on his throne. He is still sovereign, we know. He still controls everything in the universe, and he can control your situation in your life. And he controls it for the good and for the outcome, the good outcome of your life. Relinquish control to God.